This is part two of our Veterans History Project Oral History with, with Mr. Arthur Bagnall. Today is Monday, May 28, uh, 2007. Um, Art, you were just talking about getting ready for your first mission, mission. Yeah, in England. Tell, tell me about that. A little bit well, more. that's a big concern because you're sitting there in a, in a Quonset hut with other people that have flown missions and they're telling you how bad, how bloody, how terrible, how awful the flak is how the fighters are and you're scared half to death and you don't want to show it because you know you're a big boy now, you're almost 19 years old. But to make a long story short, you're still a kid and you act like a kid. Well, you try not to act like a kid, but you are a kid. But anyhow, you, 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 we had to wait. I guess we waited two weeks before we flew that first mission. But in the meantime, they had us flying all over England, um, dropping uh, photographic bombs, so to speak. They take photographs of where your bombs are supposed to drop. Don't ask me how that works, I don't know. But anyway, they, the, the bombardier would go around and try to drop these bombs on different assigned targets. And uh, they would generally be the statue in the middle of a little town. They always had some sort of a statue in the marketplace in these little towns in England, not all of them, but many of them. And uh, we saw a lot of England. Flying over around, we never knew. You couldn't go near London, boy. You didn't go near London, or they got upset because you know Germans were still getting V2s, V1s, and V2s at that time. V2s mostly, but but anyhow, you you did fly a lot, a lot of those missions just so the navigator and the bombardier could get experience. And why they flew us as gunners on those missions, I never did know because what well, we went along. And believe it or not, some of the planes went down on those missions. They, do something dumb, run out of, I don't know what happened, the engine would go, blur. you know, anyway, they, an experienced pilot will lose an engine, and I guess he'd lose his nerve or didn't have enough experience not to fly with just three. You can fly with a bomber, even with, well, I don't have bombs in it, but you can fly a bomber for some distance with just three engines. But I guess in those days, they, they didn't have enough experience to know what to do or how to do it. But we saw planes, we know of planes that went down just in practice missions. But. Uh, we finally flew our first mission. I can't remember. It was in Germany somewhere. I can't remember now where it was. But we did bomb France one time, Roy and France. But Essen was our biggest target. We bombed uh, Kiel submarine base up in the North Sea. That's where the Germans had submarines under about 25 feet of concrete or something, maybe 15 feet of concrete under, you know, to protect them from being bombed. When you uh, when you're going on these missions, what time what time do you leave to go on the missions? Well, they get you up, believe it or not, uh, about four four thirty in the morning, and some guy comes in and sh just shakes your bunk. You had to put a white towel on the foot of your bed. Our bed's made up of, of of just wires. We didn't have spring. We just had wires with three cushions on them. We had to wire the cushions together so that they would stay together. <laughs> and but uh, and of course no sheets, but. We had uh, we had lights in the in the in the Quatsa hut. Of course, the bathroom was 150 feet away, cold showers, and we had a latrine about 50 feet away, I guess, from us. Open air latrine it wasn't even closed in, but they would come in if you had a white towel on, the, on your bunk, the foot of your bunk, and we all, all we all had to sleep together, like in a group. They didn't mix people up. You always your 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 bunks were almost touching each other. We had uh, double deck bunks. And they would see the white towel, they would know to wake you up. And we got up about 4.15 in the morning, and then we went to chow, which was Johnny powdered eggs. And um, we got fresh eggs, I think, for the first week we were over there, and then that, that ended that. And a lot of sea rations, too. We did get out of the can. We didn't get fresh meat or anything. A lot of corned beef, corned beef and corned willy, they called it, which was dehydrated carrots and potatoes and, and corned beef out of a can from Argentina. I still like corned beef. I even like spam. <laughs> we got a lot of spam. That was better than what the infantry got. And we lived a lot better than what these infantry boys had, believe me. I was happy to be in the Air Corps as opposed to the infantry. Those, they had it rough, those boys in the infantry. Believe me, they did. All of them did, whether they were up on the front lines or not. But we would go to the mission, uh, go to the briefing, and because I was a toggleer eventually, I had to go to the bombardier briefing as well. But we, the general, what they did, they had this big map, which you may see in movies, where they open up this big map, and there's a chaplain up there praying for us, and then there's a, an officer telling us where we're going to bomb. And nobody in there can leave that building practically that day because they know where the mission is. So everything is kept to a secret. Now they had extra, sometimes they had extra crews. 
in case some crew pilot got sick or something, they'd have another crew to take his place. And by that time, we were assigned our own airplane. And if one crew was taken sick, well, then they had a, a substitute crew to take over. Well, that crew would be would be locked in that building until the uh, the bombs were dropped, and then they could go back, go home. They they kept it. You know, where the mission was going to be. Now, we had missions. When I say missions, you always had three targets. You had a primary target, a secondary target, and a third target. The reason for that was if you had weather conditions, you couldn't hit the primary target. The primary target may be Essen. The secondary, and the secondary target wouldn't be 50 or 60 miles from Essen, maybe. Uh, and, the, and the third was sent. Quite often, we didn't hit the primary target because of weather. If it, cloudy, if it had so many clouds, uh, we, we couldn't bomb. We could bomb through clouds, but it wasn't that advantageous to do so. So um, I don't think the bomb sites could see through clouds, but they could go through some cloud coverage. So quite often you'd, uh, well, once in a while you'd, you would hit the primary target. Mm -hmm. But uh, anyway, you knew where you were going, and you knew how you were going to get there. And you did evasive action. In other words, you didn't fly from here to New York. You went, uh, you, didn't, you went around Philadelphia to get to New York. You didn't want them to know where you were going. You didn't want the Germans to know where you were going to end up going. But we hit the targets, and this is, I think, good and humanitarian-wise thinking. We tried to hit the target between 1, 12 and 1 o'clock in the afternoon. And the reason for that was, uh, well, these are industrial targets. If it's a military target, you didn't care. But industrial target, you were going to bomb French and Polish and Czechoslovakian prisoner, but I won't call them prisoners. Well, you may be prisoners. The Germans had to go, you know, their people were all in the army and, and navy or whatever. So the Germans went around to the French and the, and the Russians and Czechoslovakians, and they put them to work in these factories. Women, men, and whatever. Children, too, probably. So you didn't want to try to kill them. You just wanted to knock out the industry. So for the first part of the war, at least when I was over there, you went after military targets. Then eventually you just hit cities. And that was, we weren't supposed to just hit cities, but we, I think eventually they just hit cities. Well, of course, we didn't always hit the target either. We missed a lot of targets, what I'm told. But you uh, you try to hit it at noontime when the, the people weren't there. You didn't want to kill innocent people, not willingly. We wanted to get Hitler, but we couldn't end Hitler's crowd. But we didn't see, succeed in doing that. But we the first mission was scary because you you thought the worst, you know. And of course, after it was over, you felt relieved. We had you, you took off in formation and uh, you you flew around England. <coughs> if the weather was clear, you because England had so much bad weather even during the the, the, the winter especially, uh, you might have to go up to ten or twelve thousand feet to get out of clouds, and that was tricky too because you sometimes miss airplanes climbing up there with you, and when you got up there, there was a uh, your your squadron had a, a, a ship up there that wasn't going to go, was not going to go on a mission. He was up there empty, flying around, shooting red and green flares or red and blue flares off. And that's the guy you followed. You formed, in other words, you formed as a, a bomber group, as a squadron. Um, um, over, you, you followed this particular uh, airplane that was up there flying around, shooting off different colored flares that you knew what you had to follow. And that's who you aimed for. And you just formed your formation from that point. So it might take you 20 to 35 minutes to form a formation. And then you would leave England, generally through, uh, you'd leave the coast of Great Yarmouth, which is on the uh, east coast of England. And we'd fly out of Great Yarmouth um, and uh, then go for the target, whether it be, in most cases it was Germany, one, one time it was France. But um, that's how you formed the, form, you formed the formation before you got over the channel. And over the channel you'd fly maybe six or 7,000, 8,000 feet, about 300, 400 miles before you hit the lines, wherever they were you would go up to 20,000 feet. Now, and in this formation, how many planes do you recall? I think it was about anywhere from 12 to 13 airplanes in a, in a squadron. But then you had three squadrons. You had a lead squadron, and a top squadron, and a lower squadron. And they were separated by about 500 feet of elevation. elevation. Mm -hmm. And um, you, you, the, the lead squadron was Jenny in the middle. Mm -hmm. And he was the guy with the bombardier, and he Jenny had a colonel flying is, you know, leading the whole mission. I think it's generally a lieutenant colonel at least, or maybe even a full colonel. No, no, lieutenant colonel. Full colonel, I think, anyway. And once in a while the chaplain would fly. And once in a while these gunnery instructors were made to fly. They had to fly so many missions 
supposedly you know, over a period of time. And because missions were different, you know, you'd, you'd flak one time, one time you'd hit fighters, one time you wouldn't see anything, many times you wouldn't drop the bombs. The target would be clouded, clouded, and you couldn't, you couldn't drop your bombs, and you'd come home. You didn't get credit for that mission, unless you saw fighters. Were you, did you have to drop your bombs somewhere on the way home, over the channel? We did one time, uh, we were, I think we were bombing Haley, H-A-L-L-E, Holly, Holly, in some place in Germany. And the target was crowded, and our pilot decided to drop his bombs, at, supposedly, in a pond or a lake. And we're talking like 15 or 20 bombs. We're talking 15 or 2,500 pound bombs. And this, you have to take the pins, some guy has to go out and take the pins out of the, the fuses on all the bombs before you drop them. You go out there with a portable oxygen mask and you pull the pins out of the nose of the bomb. Mm -hmm. And uh, the radio operator generally got stuck with that because you could maintain radio silence. You didn't use the radio except for an emergency. But uh, anyhow, you, you pull the pins out so that the bombs would hit the airstream. The propeller on the front of the bomb would set the fuse. It's like a little propeller, maybe four inches or five inches in, in length. And when the airstream hit the, hit the bomb, it would turn the propeller, revolve the propeller, and that would set up the fuse, I guess. And uh, those bombs made quite a big smoke thing down when, he, when the, you could see him go off. But uh, we dumped him in the lake, and boy, did he get chewed out for that. You know, it was. You do the you put the bring those bombs back. Well, one time we we came back from a mission with the bombs, and the bomb went down the runway with us. Really? Didn't go off. Thank God it didn't go off. I don't know whether because we didn't have the fuse set or what, but the bomb fell out of the airplane and went right down the runway with us. But that was kind of scary. Went right through the bomb bay. But the, the first mission was really t scary, and then after that you felt more comfortable. It wasn't as bad as they said it was. We hadn't seen fighters, probably. I don't remember what the first mission was, but I remember Essen and I remember Berlin and uh, a few others that we flew. How many missions did you fly? I think it was 13. It was either 11 or 13 that I get credit for. We must have gone up 20, 23 or 4 times, but toward the end of the war, Patton was making so many advances that we couldn't, uh, like they bombed St. Lowe, you know, during, before I got over there, they bombed St. Lowe and, mm -hmm. my golly, they killed thousands of B-29. Uh, 29th Division troops, which are Maryland troops, Maryland Pennsylvania troops, yeah. they were killed. They went up and bombed, you know, they didn't have communications. Mm -hmm. uh, even when we were there, we didn't have good communication. But uh, that, that happened. So if Patton had advanced, you know, Patton was, did his own thing. Yeah. And uh, he uh, advanced, we would, uh, we'd have to stay behind him. Because mm -hmm. he was going like mad, even, even before the bulge, he was taking off like birds. But you, you had to, so quite often, well, I don't know how many, I know we must have flown at least six or seven missions that we didn't get credit for because we couldn't drop our bombs. During the, during the flights over to these bomb, bomb sites that you're going to, uh, the targets, radio silence? Radio silence completely. We had intercom. We intercom. Could talk, we could, could talk into each other, but we had radio silence. The, 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 the radio operators just went along to listen. Are you seated up in the in the in the? Uh... We don't get into the turrets. Uh, what happens? Let me tell you about getting on the when the, you get out to the the plane. And first thing you do, we had to check. Um, we had to turn the propeller pops. It, it, it makes them start easier if you give them a couple of rotations each prop. So again, the buck sergeants or the corporals of those days. Well, I was a buck sergeant then. Pardon me, I was been promoted. Uh, you had to turn the props. So, Ford John and I would get the duty of turn. He turned one blade of the prop, and I turned the other one. Now, a 135-pound turkey like myself, turning the props wasn't that easy. And then we had to get flak suits and get on. And then it was my job also to check all the oxygen. I had to go each station to make sure the oxygen was working in each gunner station. The pilots checked their own, and so you had each one of us had duties that we had to perform. The engineer, for example, he was the he was the Sperry. He was the um, Martin Turret, top gunner, he, he had to do certain performances. He had to, with the ground crew, man, he had to talk about how, what, what problems were they having, are the engines okay, blah, blah, blah. Is the hydraulic system working, blah, 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 you know. Are, are the ailerons working, you know, the whole bit. He had to go over with, with the ground crewman. The ground crewman would pre-fright the, the planes at four o'clock in the morning while we were having chow. They would run up the engines and they'd check them out to see that they were operating you know, efficiently. Uh, and move the parts and so forth. I mean, maybe check the radios up, or I don't know. But they did 
some of those things. And check the instrumentation of, of the aircraft. Of course, those airplanes weren't as complicated as they are now. They didn't have the equipment on them that they have now. But uh, we would get in the plane with our flak suits, and then we would all start getting dressed because we put on heated suits. We, we wore long john underwear, and then heated suits, and then our heated boots. Uh, and our shoes, of course, we would take off and, and we'd tie those around our neck, or if we couldn't get them in the turret with us, we'd have them close by, because you needed those if you bailed out. And our parachute had to be close by. Uh, and we had, a, uh, for example, we had a, where I was up in the nose, there was a, what they call a, the wheel turret. The, the, the airplane had a tricycle landing gear, the nose wheel and two other wheels. And there was an opening to get out right where the nose wheel was. So you could jump out there if you could get by the nose wheel, and uh, when you're in flight, and you had to you had to have the the, uh, the nose wheel down to get out, I guess. And then we had what they called a camera hatch in the back um, of the plane. You could get the people back there could get out through that. But um, we fortunately never parachuted out. You know, we never even practiced parachuting out. Fortunately. But uh, you knew how to do it, or you, you, you hoped you knew how to do it. But if you landed without your shoes, you were in trouble. That's a good point. I would not have thought about that. You had to have the shoes. That's a good but we tip carried, that we We carried a 45 pistol, and we had ammo, and we had uh, uh, in our pockets our flight suits were kind of snazzy. We had uh, pockets with maps. We had ma the part of Germany we were going over, for example. They gave us two or three maps all folded up like in material, made out of material of some kind. They were folded. And you didn't open them unless you had, you know, unless you had to. And we had them in our pockets, so if you landed near Munich, Germany, for example, you could hopefully find your way to Switzerland. Hopefully. And some people did, believe it or not. Many didn't, but most, some did. But uh, they, they, they took care of us. They, they tried their darndest to make it as safe for us as they could. The, uh the, the, you, you flew up probably about 20 times, you said, and you got credit for about 13. I got 13 credit for about, I think maybe 12 or 13. I don't remember now. I've written it down somewhere, but I don't know what, where I put it. Um, daylight missions? They were all daylight missions. All daylight missions. Some of your memories, you talked about in the, in the first the thing, like seeing the flak coming up, going through the flak. You're at 20 some thousand feet, right? It's only about 22,000 feet. You wouldn't be higher if you could get up higher. Yeah. <laughs> Why did you become the toggle guy? Was that because of the bombardier? The bombardier, I think after three missions, he uh, just disappeared. I don't, I don't know. I can't remember now. I don't remember. I don't think we even told us, but somebody said he cracked up, but I, I don't know. But uh, anyway, he, he was no longer. So uh, I was moved up from the waist because the bombardier would have, um, the, um, the nose gunner would have um, had the, uh, the navigator would have flown that turret probably uh, if the bombardier was there. I think that's who would have flown it. No, no, I would have flown that turret. I'm all, I'm all wet. No, I would have had that turret, period. But there was a bombardier, a nose gunner, and a navigator all up in this little area. And we're talking about a, a, a place about three and a half by four and a half feet. Okay. Three guys in flak suits. And you know they didn't all they didn't all weigh 135 pounds like I did, in that one little area, plus the nose wheel sitting in your lap, and um, mm -hmm. so it was pretty crowded in that part of the aircraft. But uh, the turret was one third the size of the area what we're talking about, and uh, I, that's right. The, no, the nose gunner just was a nose gunner, but the other without a bombardier, I would um, have this toggle switch in my turret. And uh, I would make myself as small as possible. I'd shrink down to nothing and look out underneath my little helmet and, oh, he dropped these bombs. And then I would do the bomb thing. And when, as soon as you dropped the bombs, the plane would go, Bloop! it would go up about 10 or 15, maybe, I don't know how many feet, but you could feel the plane just rise. Mm -hmm. It was all that weight going out, you know. Of course, the bombs didn't drop. They dropped uh, in, in, uh, in, in sequence. They didn't all fall at one time. Okay. That each bomb is, is attached to a shackle, uh, electric, electrically. That's how you drop them, and they each shackle works, and it, it just it doesn't. They don't all go out at one time. They, oh, they go clip, 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 you know, boom, 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 and the plane would just rise. It would just almost jerk up, just so to speak. You, you feel it, bloop, go up, and 
and then you knew you got rid of the bomb. Then if the bombs didn't go out, and sometime, one time the bombs didn't all go out, then the radio operator had to get, take a, an old gun barrel and go out on the Bombay rack, and the bomb, go out in the Bombay area, and we're talking about a 10-inch piece of, of, of aluminum running from one end of the plane to the to tail section of the plane, where he went out and stood out there, and he took the barrel of a 50 caliber gun and beat the heck out of the shackle to try to get it to drop the bomb. Not hit the bomb, just hit the shackle. And one time he had to do that to get the bomb to drop out. For some reason the shackle didn't open. Got out though. It, it dropped, fortunately. What do you do with it? You know, <laughs> if that propeller's going around, you got a live bomb there. Because the propeller would go around, I don't know how many times, but and then it, I think it would fall off, maybe, I'm not sure. But that thing was, it would explode if you hit it. Yeah, you want I guess, I, I don't know. You want to get it out of the plane. We had the bomb dump, where I was stationed in North Pickenham, uh, the bomb dump, the, the Air Force that they had, the air base they had previously, I think it was called something else, the, the bomb dump went up and four or five people were killed. It's just all of a sudden something happened. They dropped those bombs without the fuse on them. They drop them off a truck sometime right on the dirt, not cement. And, and then they put them on a wagon. They had little hand cranks to put the bombs on the wagon so they could move them underneath the air. See, they bombed the airplanes during the night. In other words, the mechanics would work on the planes practically. When we came back from mission, those mechanics deserved a medal. They really did. They were, two of them would work on an airplane all night long, either patching up the holes if there were holes. And then there weren't always holes in the plane. One time I think we had over 100 holes in the plane, small ones, you know, three or four inches, two inches from the flak. But uh, they had mechanical problems. They had to fix engines. Now, if they had to take an engine out, of course, the plane was down for two or three days. But they, they were always doing something with those airplanes. It was, they were always tinkering with them, doing something with them. So those fellows worked all night long. Mm -hmm. And then the armament people had to come along and put more ammo in the machine guns. They had to put the bombs in the next morning. So, mm -hmm. And then they had to fuel up the airplane. Then they had to pre-flight the airplane. And then we got on the airplane only to have it ruined again the next day. <laughs> you know? So they had an endless job. These guys worked seven days a week. We worked three days a week and had a day. We had we three days on and one day off. How did you deal with uh, these missions yourself, personally, emotionally? Did you, did you handle it well, do you think? Uh, I was scared to death the first, I guess, the first mission or two. And I, uh, I was. I had, I had a lot of faith. i tell you what happened. I had my best friend, Leroy Wissy, got killed in the Battle of the Bulge just before, I think it was before I went overseas. And then my other friend, Elmer Lang, who lived across the street from me, he dropped dead with a heart attack. And then Arthur Brooks, who lived behind me, in the alley behind me, he was killed as an MP someplace. And I thought, boy, three strikes, I think I've got it made. And then that's the heck of a way to look at it. But I thought, uh, God had been so good to me for so many years. Uh, and my aunt had been so good to me, and in fact, all my whole family, my sister as well, had been so good to me that I, 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 I thought I would be taken care of, and I didn't. Um, I worried about it, and got concerned about it, because. Uh, but as I say, I got over there fortunately toward the end of the war, and things weren't as rough as they had been. I mean, earlier, the Air mm -hmm. Force got beat up a heck of a lot more than what we were getting beat up when I was there. I was very fortunate in that respect. What do you recall about your last mission? You know, you you flew all these missions. You flew, you bombed Berlin. Yeah, we bombed Berlin, and my golly, I went back to Berlin about ten years later, and I didn't realize Berlin was so big. It's humongous. Yeah, I've been there twice since, but it's uh, it, my golly, it has its own airport almost downtown. Uh, just uh, big, big, lots of museums. It's a, it's a heck of a big, and now, of course now with the the Germans, the Russians out of there, it's it, it's it's a whole new city, really. It's completely, that Russian part's completely rebuilt. But uh, uh, I, don't, I don't remember the last mission. I remember the mission we flew over Kiel, Germany. We went up over, actually over Sweden. It came down from Sweden to bomb Kiel. Beautiful Sunday, I remember. It was a lovely Sunday. And I thought to myself, what the heck am I doing up here? Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, it's just, I mean, we're going to drop these nasty, I mean, I wasn't proud of dropping bombs. I really wasn't. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure everybody was, anybody else was either. We knew somebody was going to get hurt down there, and all we wanted to do was get rid of Hitler and get the war over. It wasn't, it wasn't fun dropping those. We knew, I, mean, I can't imagine what it would be like getting those bombs coming down on you. I just can't imagine. 
I mean, flak was nothing compared to those bombs. I'd seen London that said it had been bombed. My golly, London didn't get a drop in the bucket. I mean, they didn't get hardly anything that damaged to them like the German cities did. Mm. God, I mean, God bless the British. Without the British, I think Hitler would have taken over England and a few other places. I'm not doubting the British at all because they did their share. Believe me, they did. They treated us well. We kind of messed up their women and did, used all their beer and had what well, anyway. But I mean, I was 18 years old. I didn't know what a woman was at that point. I didn't know what she was. But anyhow, to make a long story short, the British did their thing. But uh, we enjoyed. I enjoyed the London during the war. I went and got to London about maybe five or six times. We got duty passes yeah. to London. Went to the theater a lot. Didn't drink beer. Didn't chase women. Did chase one or two, but didn't catch them. Your uh, your uh, work. Uh uh, when you flew to Kiel, uh, Kiel. You, that, that, and what was the importance of bombing Kiel? It's the, a submarine base. The submarine base, and the, they were the in Germans, concrete? They were embedded, not all of them, but they had uh, bursts for these submarines that I think had 10 feet of concrete over them or something. How about the, what kind of flak did you face that day going in? Was I don't remember, but I don't think we got any flak. I, I, I'm not sure. I can't remember. And of all of your missions, what was the one that was probably the hardest? Essen, Essen, Essen. Essen? And what was in Essen? Was it an industrial? I think it was industrial. I don't really know what was there now, but it was in highly industrialized. Was that the flak that you could see in field? I counted 110 on? holes, I think, and stopped counting in the airplane. How did the, main, how did the airplane make it through? It just did. Well, the holes weren't all that big. And they didn't, evidently, they didn't hit hydraulic lines. Mm -hmm. That's the first thing they check when they come down and see if the hydraulic lines are working and the electrical wire. Hydraulic first and mm -hmm. then, because that operates the, the wing, the tip, you know, the wing tips, the mm -hmm. ailerons or whatever you call them. But the uh, electrical has a big thing too, of course. But the engines are important as well. But in the fuselage, we count over 110 holes, I think, and then we stopped counting. But they weren't, some of them weren't that big. They were some of them maybe one or two or three or four inches in, in diameter. But uh, anyway, it was, a, Essen was a, was a dog compared to, to the other ones. Mm -hmm. they, well, you don't have a bad mission. You call it a milk run. Milk run, okay. And uh, so we had some milk, we were lucky. We had milk runs. Um, now, where were you Physically, what, what do you recall about when the war came to an end in Europe? D, you mean you mean the D Day? V E Day. V E Day. Yeah. V E Day. I I was in London the day before V Day. V E Day, and for our last trip to London, we were in London, having gone to the theater. We'd go to a matinee when we'd get one, and go to night as well, because I didn't go to bars, but and go to Hyde Park. We stayed in a Red Cross club there in London. I think it was like three or four dollars a night. Where did you go? Like, how did you get from wherever you were? You know? Well, in, the train system and still is good in, in England. The train system was even good then. The trains ran on time even during the war. It was amazing. Yeah. And uh, sometimes you had to stand up on the train. But we would go from North Pickenham to Swatham to, to through Cambridge. Cambridge was halfway to London. Oh yeah. We were about a hundred miles, I guess, north east of London. Okay. And uh, of course, London was a big, big city. And we would land, we had to get on the, we, the railroad station was on one side of the, the, uh, the river. Now, what's it called in London, the river? The Thames? Thames, thank you. Mm -hmm. My memory's starting to go. Mm -hmm. uh, we had to go to, we had to get on a subway to get to, uh, across from one. London had like f maybe five or six railroad stations. And they were scattered all over London in a way, in the outskirts of London for, for, for mostly. And uh, I don't think any of them were really downtown, but the Thames. And you had to get from there in a cab, which is expensive, or take a subway or something, and get to where you were going. And we always stayed at near Hyde Park. The, um, I want to say Red Cross, but I'm not sure it was Red Cross. It may have been Red Cross. The Red Cross, by the way, did one mm -hmm. heck of a job. I mm -hmm. mean, my sister was in the Red Cross, but and I heard criticism about the Red Cross workers and all that. but. I never, I never saw a Red Cross worker or Red Cross situation where they didn't do, I thought, an outstanding job. But anyway, we would go from the train station to, to Hyde Park, which is the big green park in London, and our, we would we'd go to this club, which served, um, well, it served some food, tea mostly, and stuff to eat, 
and then you could get billeted there. And we'd go to an, actually a house in London. We'd go maybe three or four blocks away to get a house where they had rented a house where they had put in army cots, you know, two, uh, two deckers. Mm -hmm. And I think for three or four dollars a night, we could stay there. And then the limeys, as we call them, not to their face, but these ladies would come up and give us hot tea and something in the morning for what they call breakfast toast, I guess it was. Even if we had just our underwear one, they'd come bouncing into the room, tea, tea! <laughs> and they'd give us a cup of hot tea and this, this biscuit or whatever it was. But we could stay there, mm -hmm. uh, and they had a shower uh, there, but they had a, a valve on the shower that literally the shower was just a trickle. Mm -hmm. It wasn't a shower. It was just like somebody turned the faucet on very slowly. And, and so we would take a wrench with us every time we went to London to take that thing off the faucet, mm -hmm. off the off the fa faucet, the water faucet that came out. Mm -hmm. So we'd get a stream of water coming out, and then we'd put it back when we left. But you know, these young kids had ingenuity, didn't they? In those days. Yes, you I, wouldn't, I wouldn't have thought of it now. But that's how we got showers there while we were in London. We got a two-day pass every month to go to London. We could only go to London or Cambridge. So after one trip to Cambridge, we said, the heck with it, we're going to London. I saw the Cambridge University campus, which was fabulous and all that, but London had a lot more going, the theater. Yeah, and you're really lucky. Did you have a chance to uh, communicate with your family back here in uh, in the Baltimore area? Did, uh, no, I, mean, I never called them or anything. I guess you could call them, but I never did. Uh, and I never called them. Now, what? The, so you were actually in London the day before VE Day? I was in London the day before VE Day. and. Uh, we got home, um, we may have gotten home the day before VE Day, but I think we got home VE Day, actually. Mm -hmm. Well, VE Day was quite a celebration. Uh, we had one nut who was a gunner, was firing his 45 automatic out the back door. In the meantime, the colonel or somebody, I think it was a colonel, lieutenant colonel, came around between shots through the door where the fire was going out. He got put in the brig. Mm -hmm. They immediately took all the pistols away from us, which they should have done, or did do so there wouldn't be any celebration. Um, and of course we were happy as larks that the, the war was over. Or at least the peace treaty had been signed. Uh, the war wasn't over, I guess, but the peace treaty had been signed. And, um, but we were, uh, that was in May, I believe. Mm -hmm. We didn't come home until early July, late June or July. They had to wait till the, we brought our B-24 home. You actually flew, 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 flew it back? back yeah. Where'd and, you fly to? Well, we, we put, we, what happened was we took on 10 or 11 ground pounders, as we called them. God bless them, they did more work than we did. And they deserve a lot more, a lot of credit too, not just the guys that flew the airplane. You know, the average guy could fly an airplane with targets in, during the war. In, in four or five months, he was through his, his 30 missions and home. Mm -hmm. These guys stayed over there for two or three years mm -hmm. and um, didn't get flying pay either. You know, we got 50% flying pay. 10% combat pay. I was making $135 a month. That was real That's bucks in those days. Mm -hmm. uh, but anyhow, because when I got out of college, I was making $200 a month. But anyhow, uh, mm -hmm. we, we, had, uh, we came home uh, by the way of uh, Scotland, where my family came from. The Bagnalls are from Scotland. And then we went to Greenland, Iceland again, and then Greenland, and then uh, Nova Scotia, mm -hmm. uh, and then back to Connecticut. And then we came home to a 30-day leave. And I, we were on our way to Okinawa, actually. That's one reason why we brought the planes back. We left all the bombs there, really? just brought planes back, and we were on our way to Okinawa with Jimmy, with Jimmy Doolittle. But by the time we got back in July uh, and got out to the state of Washington, state of Washington uh, we were told pilots with so many 135 points you needed, you could get out. And um, I only had something like 64 points, I think. Mm -hmm. You got points by the number of months in service, number of months overseas. Missions didn't count. It was that kind of service. Longevity, I think, counted. And uh, rank didn't count either. But um, then they told us that they were unloading ships in Seattle, taking troops off of them. They weren't going to Okinawa. They weren't going to Okinawa, they were going over there to, to invade. Well, they're going to Okinawa to, to invade Japan, yes, but fortunately they dropped the atomic bombs, or unfortunately for the Japanese, they dropped the atomic bombs and we didn't have to go to Okinawa. So I just stayed in the freight of Washington 
I guess, for six months or longer, and uh, worked in the BOQs, uh, BOQ ambassador's officers' quarters. What 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 part of Washington was it? Called? Afraid of Washington. It's almost in central Washington. It's in the wheat country. It's uh, afraid of E P H A T R A. And that's a uh, that was an air base. An air base, uh huh? And uh, so you're you're when you flew back from London, fr I mean from uh, from England, you flew it, you fly back at about July of '45. Right. And you were actually went you, you landed in Connecticut and had and had we, we gave we landed in Connecticut and this is funny I think and unusual. They took our oxygen mask from us. We all had two oxygen masks. Uh, they took all our flying equipment, our heated suits, and very carefully put them in sheets, white sheets, right on the runway, right on the tarmac, and got our last four digits of our serial numbers, which is 4823. And they wrapped them all up, and they had like 10 bundles. Now, the guys that we brought back with us, the ground pounders, they just took off. You know, they went someplace. And we gave up our airplane. We didn't. We didn't see that airplane again. And we got on trains or buses and stayed up there for a night or two. And then we were given furlough. But when we got out to Afraid of Washington, believe it or not, the sheet opened up. Well, it wasn't a sheet. It was a big paper bag. And the, here it is B four eight two three. Bagnall, this is yours. They handed me my oxygen mask, my flying equipment. Really, you name it. They handed you everything. And how, when you got out to Afraid of Washington, how did you guys get out there? Did you fly? We went out. I think we got out there. No, no, no. We went out on trains. Yeah. We went, I think we went to Fort Meade and, and went out on a troop train. I'm did, not sure. Did we, you have to meet up? Did you meet up with your crew at Fort Meade or did you just No, we, just meet, sort of we, got we met up out there, I think, because they came from all over the place. So now you're all set to the same crew. Same crew. All set to maybe go to, to Japan. Well, we're going to go on a ship to go to Okinawa. All right. At first, they were going to fly us. They were going to fly us from England around through India to get to Okinawa. And they decided that wasn't feasible or practical. And they decided to send us home and give us, a, of course, we, we love that, getting home, you know. Mm -hmm. Truth of the matter is, we should have stayed over there another six or months or two more years and kept the damn Russians out of the area. But we, mm -hmm. my uncle, who retired from the Army, when I got home, said, good to see you, son, but you should have stayed over there. Said, what are you talking about? And this dumb, dumb uncle of mine, he must have been 60-some years old at the time, because uh, my father was almost 60, he was older. He said, it's good to have you home, but you said, you and the rest of you should stay over there and keep those dirty Russians out of Europe. And I you're out of your mind. I didn't say this to him, but I mean, I thought, you're nuts. And I thought, where did this kid get his smarts? You know, where, he didn't go to college, you know. Where did he get all this, you know. He knew what but, was going uh, on. And he knew what was going on. He'd been in the service for 27 years. He got credit for each month he was over in, in the army, over in the Philippines or in the Europe. He got t uh, time, double time for that serving during wartime. Now the uh, the uh, the time that you're finally spending in effort, afraid of Washington, your your crew must be getting to just break off, right? Yeah, the, those that had a, uh, those that had so many points mm -hmm. got out. None of our crew got out. But we, what happened was the tail gunner Forgeron and I, who were buddies anyway. He was had been the the, the ball, spirit, spirit ball turret gunner, but they didn't. They took that off the plane before we started flying missions. It just wasn't practical to fly that thing. But anyhow, he and I were buddies, and he and I got a job um, uh, in the BOQs. Um, mm -hmm. I did administrative work there. Well, I was in charge of the janitors, taking care of the BOQs, and uh, cleaned up the latrines and that sort of thing. And he worked there as well. So we, we were stationed there, uh, and we just had to wait till we got the points to get out. In the meantime, I volunteered to take a, uh, a job flying in the, these big uh, C-135s or whatever they were. They may not have been that particular plane, but it was a big plane going to fly around Russia as a listening station. They had radar equipment and listening equipment that they could find out what activity was going inside of Russia at the time, and I volunteered for that. But in the meantime, my sister died. And I said, oh, I ought to get home. They need me. Well, they didn't need me. I wasn't that big a help to anybody, but um, I decided to get home. Besides that, I had a girlfriend who I'm now married to. That's nice. But at any rate, um, we've only been married eight, seven years. But anyhow, she had two good husbands. Now she has me. But anyhow, we, um, my first wife died after having three children. But I, I volunteered for that group, and I was sent back to the 
someplace in Nebraska, and uh, and I reneged on it, and I got holy heck for reneging. But I told him my sister had died and I belonged home. So then I spent the next four or five months in Washington, D.C. I could look out of my bunk, stay in my bunk and see the capital of, of Washington, the, the, the dome down there. I, I was doing a, just office work in the office there in, in Washington, D.C. So you moved back, you you sort of finished off your military World War II here in D.C. In D.C. Yeah. To D.C. and uh, you were doing office work? Office work. Mm -hmm. I was in the Quartermaster Corps. And then when were you formally discharged? May the 8th, I think it was, 1946. May of 46, you were discharged. And what rank were you at that time? Just a buck sergeant still. Okay. So you're discharged in May of 46, but your service isn't, isn't going to be over at that point. You were discharged from Washington, D.C.? Was that where you were? Are you here? Well, Camp Meade, actually. Camp Meade. Everything happened at Camp Meade. They only ship, shipped you back up there. You got your formal, thank yeah. you very much, you're done. How yeah. did you wind up staying? And Because uh, you, you had service in the Korean conflict, too. Well, what happened, I got out and went to college. Where'd you go? University of Baltimore. I went to Western Maryland College initially, and I couldn't afford it. I couldn't mm -hmm. rate, I couldn't, we didn't get 50, I think we got 50 bucks. A month. I don't know how much we got, but anyway, it, it cost almost that much just for room and board. To go on the GI, it must have been part of the GI Bill, Oh, I was right? on the GI Bill, yeah. But yeah. I, 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 I only went there a short time, and I Baltimore. transferred to University of Baltimore here in Baltimore. University of Baltimore, and what did you take? I took an easy course, business administration. Mm -hmm. And then I did that in three years, because mm -hmm. I went to summer school. In the meantime, I worked at the A&P grocery store for 37 and a half cents an hour, selling meat to ladies and gentlemen. But I got a good price, and my, my mother's meat bill went down considerably, because I was working to the meat market, and the manager would mark it way down, about half price. So that, that helped. So you're going to Baltimore College. University, University of Baltimore. You, you, I'm sorry, University of Baltimore. Paying, paying $35 a month. Mm -hmm. How is it that you wind up getting recalled to go to? Uh, I heard Mr. Churchill, a famous Mr. Prime Minister Churchill of England, make a statement. I want to say out in Iowa, but I'm not sure. Uh, he made a statement out there, and he called the dirty Russians the dirty bears that they are. And I thought, uh-oh, we're going to have another war. I'm going to get a commission this time. I've got a degree. I'm a big shot. I got a BS. I think I'm full of BS. But to make a long story short, uh, I signed up for a reserve outfit. And I'm not exaggerating. In a month and a half's time, I was on my way to San Francisco. Uh, initially, the order said that I was to report to a B 29 base in Oklahoma or someplace as a gunner. Well, I didn't know anything about a B-29. I'd seen a B-29 and been in one at one time only. And the B-29 gunners were not like what I had been. They, they don't, they, except for the tail gunner, they're not even near the guns. They're mm -hmm. located somewhere else and looking at a, something screen mm -hmm. or something. But anyhow, I, I got another set of orders that said report to Hamilton Air Force Base, which is San Francisco, north of San Francisco. So after calling New York, they told me to, to follow the second set of orders. And I got on the boat going to Norfolk and got down in Virginia somewhere, and next thing I know, I'm on an airplane going to Hamilton Air Force Base. This time, it's the Army Air Force. I mean, it's the U.S. Air Force, not Army Air. So it's a blue uniform, not like the old khaki uniforms we had. And I get out there, and I'm still a buck sergeant. This time, I'm working in the quartermaster. Literally, what it is, I had two corporals and a couple of whacks that are helping me to distribute office equipment and bedding to different barracks and offices off of a truck. Okay. And after three months of doing that, I only served a year during the Korean episode. That was from 1949 or 1950 to 51. Um, I uh, applied for a job in public information. Now, having that BS that I talk about, I'm sure helped me get a job with a full, with a lieutenant colonel who reported to the general, the two-star general in the base, for the Western Air Defense Command, which was stationed at Hamilton Air Force Base. And these people were to keep the fighters and bombs or missiles or something out of you know the United States, as far as the western coast was, west coast was concerned. So I, I worked there for I guess six months or longer, in the PO office, the public information office, for this colonel who became a full colonel. And he had an English secretary. She was from England, so we had a lot in common. We, I mean, I had enjoyed England, and the English always like to hear people enjoying England. English and the uh, well anyhow we had we had a, I had a good year I, so that's where you were assigned this is called Hamilton Air Force Hamilton Base Air, it's no longer there no longer there but it, it was a, a big headquarter base for the 
Fourth Air Force, I think, at one time. So there were two two generals there. One was Fourth Air Force, and one was Western Air Defense Command. And you stayed there just for that for that year, mm -hmm. right? So I stayed one year, and they let me out. In the meantime, they made me a staff sergeant. Well, that's great. So I got a big raise. I must have been making one hundred sixty-seven dollars a month or something. Finishes a staff sergeant. And then, and was that it? When they, when they, you were, your, your, your commitment was done. That was it. Yeah, MacArthur. Well, I was, I was committed not, not for just a year, but they let me out after a year. MacArthur, you know, had started invading China. Yes. And that was a no-no. Okay. I wish the hell they had done it now, frankly. <laughs> but uh, maybe I don't know. We, we certainly weren't prepared to beat China at that point. Our troops were, you know, eight million, eight thousand miles away or something. But uh, um, I mean, they could have beat us all the heck, I guess. But anyway, I, he made that statement about, let's go to get China, and they brought MacArthur home. And as a result of it, I got out. Oh, what happened was, I, I, I was going to get a reserve commission, and all I had to do was throw my BS degree at them and go before a review board of you know several officers and whatever, mm -hmm. and maybe answer some questions or something. But the problem was, my sister had died, and she was really my cousin, but she I like my sister because I lived with her all my life, and uh, I thought my, I better get home, and um, that, that's what I did. Oh no, that, yeah, that's what I, I'm, I'm getting my stories mixed up about one war. Well, that was the end of World War II. Um, uh, yeah, that's when you came back no, there. It, it, actually, I was wrong about World War II. This was this was the. I okay. Don't, I don't know. I'm, I'm I'm confused. I can't remember. So you wanted this reserve commission, but uh, I had to go. I had to stay in for two years. Mm -hmm. And I, you're going overseas if you take the commission. This is the word I got. And going overseas meant Korea. Now, Korean Air Force wasn't that bad. You know, you, get, you didn't get, you got shot at, but you didn't get shot at on the ground. So I decided I didn't want to try for the reserve commission. So I took the discharge instead. So I got an honorable discharge for the second time. Excellent, and that ended your that ended your service mm -hmm. for sure. I got out. I somehow got out of the reserves along with it. I don't know how that happened, but I did. Now let me ask you as we as we wrap up here uh, in the next couple number of minutes. I just wanted to ask you a couple questions. Now, did you keep in contact with the guys you fought with in World I War II? I kept in contact with uh, uh, Arthur Forgeron uh, for a number of years. He came down to to Baltimore. Baltimore, where I was living at the time, two or three times. Uh, I went to Boston on one occasion. Then we stopped communicating. Uh, I did not keep in contact uh, with Warren Evans. He was the radio operator. I kept mm -hmm. in contact with him for a while. He was already a father when I knew him. But I, I don't keep in contact with any of them now. Okay. And they're not listed in any of the eight there. I get eight for Air Force. Uh -huh. uh, Newsletters. In fact, I get we have a newsletter from our 491st Bomb Group, which is what I was overseas was called the 491st Bomb Group, uh, 853rd Squadron of the 8th Air Force, and I get a newsletter every every two or three months from them, and they're not even listed in it. Did you uh, did you go to reunions? Never been to a reunion. How about going back to England? You've been back to England. Been back to England, I guess, at least six or eight times. I used to go to Europe, uh, my daughter would say, Dad, you're not just going to go back to England, are you? And I said, well, I know my way around and I could read the language. I can't understand them all the time, but I can understand most of them, and they can understand me. Why don't you go somewhere else? So finally I went to different places. As a matter of fact, I've been to about 95 different countries and 20-some islands uh, since I got out of the service. I've been all over the place. but. Uh, did you go to uh, back to Pickenham? In oh England? yeah, even back there. there. I hired a cab and a train and a cab to take me up there, and I met some of the people that I act, believe it or not, I met the, the sister to the, the person I knew when I was there, and I saw the little church I used to go to. Well, God, we all had religion. We were going over to Germany, and I saw the, the little church. The church is about the size of a match matchbox at this point, but uh, most of the base was it was just deteriorated. But on the runways, they were running, uh, raising turkeys. Mm -hmm. And I found out recently they're not raising turkeys there anymore. I get the a magazine. I get this article about every three months from the 491st Bomb Group, and it tells us what's going on over there. They must have uh, markers, mementos to the the people there. Do you think are there any plaques or, uh, you know, if one were to go? I to don't know. Even today? even the little group, what they call the iron munglers and the grocery store, they call them munglers or for some reason. The stores weren't there. The church was there. The tavern 
was there when I went back. But um, I was the only one that went. And what was stupid, I went about a week or ten days before they were having a reunion at that air base. They were having an 8th mm -hmm. Air Force reunion for that particular air base, I guess. I'm not sure. And I got there about a week early. Uh. And they were preparing for it. They were putting out, uh, getting ready to put up flags and you know, planning the thing, what they were going to do for the GIs and all that sort of thing. And I missed it by about a week, I guess. I would really, really would have enjoyed that. But I did see one person that I, that I knew when I was there, believe it or not. A British person. And uh, your, uh, did you, did, what did you do after, uh, after World War II and after Korea? What was your career? What well, I had already do? gone through college and gotten a BS in this business administration, which uh, anyway, and uh, I went to work in a credit department. I had worked one summer in the credit department of Montgomery Wards. So I went to work for General Motors Acceptance Corporation, basically repossessing automobiles, <laughs> which was a nice pastime. And I did that for about a year. And then I went to work for Remington Rand, trying to sell their electric typewriter. Well, IBM had a, an electric typewriter that was far superior to Remington Rand's electric typewriter. But Remington Rand came up with a typewriter that was supposed to be just, just for the, it, it was not a spectacular typewriter, but it was to replace all manual typewriters. You don't see manual typewriters, haven't seen them for years. And their idea was, we'll sell the, we won't spell, uh, sell the expensive IBM typewriter that does beautifully work, blah, blah, blah. You know, it does have a little ball that the, the, the letters wrote around them. They had, we still had keys on ours. And uh, it wasn't as fast as the IBM and all that. But anyway, it was sold a lot cheaper. But I couldn't sell those. I don't think I sold one typewriter in six months. But anyhow, I went to work in Remington Rand selling typewriters. And um, I couldn't sell beans. Although I have a gift to gab. My wife thinks I have too much of a gift to gab. She's probably right. I then went to work for uh, uh, Westinghouse down at the Baltimore Airport, Baltimore, Wilkins Avenue, really, in the electronics division as a as a uh, expediter. You know, where are the parts? Ship me the parts, and then became well, became I guess an expediter is what I was, or maybe assistant buyer one time. And from there, I went out to try selling for a manufacturer's representative, and I didn't do beans again, so <laughs> I went back to work for the. Um, Sperry Gyro Corporation, which became Univac, which right. became Computers, which again was second to IBM, second, probably tenth to IBM. And I worked as the procurement buyer and supervisor and then manager in the procurement department for 20 some, 27 years, from which I retired. Well, I, after, well, they closed the plant or I wouldn't have retired at age 61. So then I went to work for Raytheon yeah. Company as a temporary uh, buyer type person, not a manager. And I bought parts for, for Raytheon's uh, equipment, in, in, again, in Bristol, it was in Bristol, Virginia, actually, Bristol, Virginia, Tennessee. But yet you've traveled. How did, how did you, well, you travel? Well, my wife died um, 17 years ago. She was only 51 years old. She was nine years younger than me. In fact, she probably wasn't the 50. And she died of uh, cancer, smoked herself to death. I never smoked cigarettes. So I, I just traveled. I've been to, I think, almost 100 countries, 90-some anyway, and 30-some islands. You love to travel? Took, I, no, I, you know, it, I'm, I'm uh, egotistical. That's a long word. I can't even spell it, but I am. I'm very egotistical. I wanted to be able to say I've been there. And I've been to, I haven't been to Portugal, for example. But I've been to Russia. I've been, uh, I've been uh, all over the China, Japan. Mm -hmm. You know, I've been all over the place. Um, how would you shape as we as we uh, as we, we finish up here? How would you say World War Two, your World War Two experience, has shaped your life? Well, I I've, I've been a little cocky at times, but I have uh, been also rather conservative in many ways. And I think it made me appreciate life. Uh, my two, well, my best buddy got killed in the bulge. I've never gotten over that. He was a good, fine Christian person. He's a better Christian than I am, really, in many ways. He was. He was 19 years old and shot. But uh, I learned, uh, I learned, I think, the value of life. 
I learned that we need friends. I know that we have to respect our elders and we have to respect our family. We have to help each other. And um, if we help each other, they help us. They help us as well. It's not a one-way street. And having grown up as, a, as an orphan, actually, uh, I missed having a mama and a papa, so to speak. And I realized the importance of, uh, well, parenthood, and I'm not the greatest parent in the world, I'm sure I'm not. Uh, I can hand out money to my three kids, but that's not all it, it takes. It takes more than that. In fact, you can ruin the heck out of them, giving them too much money. But um, I would hope that my children, my greatest hope is that my children will be better morally, spiritually, physically, and monetarily than I am. Money is not a problem at this point. Not with me it is, and I've been very fortunate in that respect. But I want my children to be better than I am and uh, to appreciate life more than, well, not any more than I have, but to appreciate life. And I hope, to, I don't think I've gotten the message through to all of them, but I've, I've tried. Well, thank you very much for sharing your uh, your World War II experiences and your Korean experiences. Well, you've been very interesting as well. Thank you, Mr. Patrick. Thank you. Appreciate it.